Trade is the transfer of goods and services, and it is what separates us from the apes, who wouldn't know a good two-for-one deal if it slapped them in their hairy faces. But that's why it's so frustrating that our favourite games are full of traders, shopkeeps and merchants who seemingly have no regard at all for the sanctity of commerce, and will happily throw your consumer rights out the window in favour of ripping you off, swindling you, or simply providing staggeringly bad customer service. Here are the shopkeepers in games who need reminding that the customer is always right. Always. You remember me, don't you? Murgo, Albion's most trustworthy provider of mystical apparatuses and enchanted items. Every child believes in some sort of magic. In fact, a few adults do too, which is why Luke is still upset that he's not yet received his letter from Hogwarts. But I'd look so good in Ravenclaw Blue! Luke, you're clearly a Hufflepuff. How dare you! Fable 2's Murgo is very aware of people's wish for magic, which is why, like a jerk, he sells some not very magical items to gullible and desperate customers. Consider this. This is truly a magical mirror. For as long as you look into it, it will make you beautiful. I'll take it. Very wise. Now, just remember, the magic only works if you look at it in complete darkness. However, one item he sold was magic, a unique music box. Go ahead and turn the handle, but mind you go somewhere quiet like. Well, truthfully, it was only magic for you because you were the legendary fourth hero. But hey, your wish of going to Castle Fairfax with your sister Rose came true. And you both lived happily ever after. No, you didn't. Instead, Lord Lucian killed Rose and pushed you out of a window. <laughs> If I'd wanted that to happen, I would have wished for that, Murgo. Still, the box reveals you to be a hero, and later on, should you have downloaded the See the Future DLC, you stumble across him by the docks in Bowerstone Market. Well, I do believe I see a hero before me. And this time, he's actually got magical items for sale. Brilliant! What have you got for me today, Murgo? But for now, we shall have to content ourselves with a pretty but slightly cursed snow globe. Just read the uh, description here. This small snow globe contains a very realistic model of a village. If you hold it to your ear, you can just make out the distant sounds of people screaming. Yeah, okay, cool, thanks, Murgo. Later, after fighting shadowy monsters to free an entrapped village, he offers you a cursed skull to deal with, like no good shopkeeper ever has. But my source has brought me a second curiosity, just as cursed as the first. Look, mate, I'm going to need some more fun items, otherwise I'm essentially paying to do my own curse clear-up. Right, what else you got? I can turn my dog into a husky. Very good! Putin's fingerprints are all over this data. He doesn't even care if we know. You should never buy anything without seeing it first, as I learned the first time I tried to buy shoes online. But you really have no choice when it comes to dealing with Master Rahul, one of the vendors in Destiny's trade hotspot, The Tower. Alright, let's get started. As a cryptarch, it's in Rahul's job description to use his wisdom to decode encrypted materials, including the engrams you find out in the field which, with his elite IT skills, can be transformed back into sweet weapons or armour. There's more if you need it. And presumably, it's also in his job description to mutter weird little phrases while doing so. Why a garden? Eden? Asperities? Asperities from Hesperus? Venus on Venus? No, no. Weird chat we can handle, but where things get infuriating is when Rahul oh so frequently decodes your engrams, some of which may have been exceedingly rare or hard to come by, and spits out an item that's significantly less fancy than its colour coding implied. Geez, Rahul, do you have any idea what I had to do to get this? I had to cooperate, Rahul, with strangers online. If harvesting engrams from the remains of some recently deceased alien sounds too much like hard work, it's also possible to buy them direct, if you've got the coin to do so. 
but you still won't know what you're actually buying until Rahul decodes his own merchandise, even though, come on, it's in his shop. He must have had a cheeky scan. A wind age, a wolf age, a presentiment of the collapse? Ultimately, Rahul makes a tidy living off the fact that apparently, in the far-flung future, he's the only one with a working copy of WinZip. Well, guess what, Rahul? I've got a working copy too of the Trades Descriptions Act 1968 and a... Oh, this is actually quite a lot, isn't it? I'm not going to read this. You win this round, Rahul. Any shopkeeper worth their salt knows to lure customers in with a bargain, like 20% extra on a pipe of Pringles, 3 for 2 on toothpaste, or buy a train ticket, get a free mortgage, wait what? Well, yes, you see Tom Nook, the infamous proprietor of the Nook's Cranny General Store in Animal Crossing, takes a very broad view of a bargain. At the start of the first game in the Community Sim series, despite having ridden the train into town with big dreams and a pocket full of cash, you won't even leave the station before this money-obsessed raccoon shopkeep has sold you a house you never asked for and taken every penny you own as a first payment against a ruinous 19,800 bell mortgage. All the cash in your pockets covers roughly 5% of the total sum, so you're now broke in a strange town with no source of income and in very, very deep with the Bank of Nook. Suggested slogan, we own you. Not what you expect from a cutesy game called Animal Crossing, unless the animals are crossing the border to escape Tom Nook's brutal protection racket. But I guess that wouldn't fit on the box. There is some good news. Kindly Mr. Nook offers to let you work off your crippling debt in his shop. He's even generous enough to hold back your meagre salary as tiny steps towards paying off that planet-sized mortgage. Planting flowers and running deliveries will be your main duties, that is, until Nook runs out of jobs for you, at which point you're, uh, fired. <laughs> On the plus side, at least now you can actually peruse the wares in Nook's Emporium and, you know, play the game. Just try, while you're collecting bugs, not to think about how you owe a mountain of money to a raccoon who also controls your only source of living supplies and has an iron stranglehold on the local economy. You know, that is a hard thing to not think about. Well, we're here. <laughs> Don't worry about saying goodbye. I'm sure we'll be doing this all again soon enough. <laughs> ah, get off my bus. You know how you win Monopoly by becoming a, well, a Monopoly? Well, generally the idea of one private company owning everything is really bad for consumers, which you quickly learn at Christmas when Aunt Mavis puts a hotel on everything. Mavis. However, a monopoly is exactly what Marcus Kincaid has going on, with his total control over all the weapons and ammo on Pandora in the Borderlands series. First introduced as our driver, he's extremely unflattering to the vault hunters he's dropping off. You with the sniper rifle and the crazy mask. You look like a Traxican wrestler moonlighting as a dominatrix, man. Whoa, harsh. I don't think I've ever heard anything said like that to a potential customer. And what's your story, young lady? What can you do? <laughs> uh, perhaps you can bake us all a wonderful cake. <laughs> I stand corrected. And you, Kincaid, will never stand again. Still, your antics make him set up shop again, revealing him to be the owner of every weapons and ammo vending machine on Pandora. Not an official one, mind, if you look closer at the machines. It's a pretty sweet gig for him, and he's also the only person you can sell your guns to. Atlas spares no expense in making guns that excel in every area. Okay, but the prices better be decent. So this is what he sells these for, so how much will he buy it off me for? What? Still, honestly, it's best not to complain, as in Borderlands 2, you quickly learn what his returns policy is. Could I have a refund, please? This gun doesn't seem to work. Hmm, I don't know. <laughs> Looks like it works to me. 
see the uh, mistake you made there, mate, was giving it to him loaded. Rookie error. It is important for a shopkeeper to protect their wares, but some go slightly further than is necessary. Should you fall short of equipment in the dark, confusing and randomly built caves of Spelunky, you can buy the kit you need from the various shopkeepers found across the game's levels. Fine, but if you fall short of equipment and the coins to buy more, you might quite reasonably think that perhaps you could borrow an item or two on credit. I mean, hey, they know you're good for it, right? But just a tip before you, um, steal, it's worth making sure that you can either A, defend yourself, or B, leg it, as the shopkeepers tend to get a little bit protective. Okay, very protective. Now, we totally understand them pulling out a shotgun should the player decide to attack the shopkeeper. But stealing? I mean, I know it's not the good thing to do, but you're probably stuck down here in these mystical caves like everyone else, buddy. Why can't you let us have one thing on the house? Even if you play by the rules, there's no guarantee you'll escape with your blood still inside your body, because should you accidentally throw something in their direction, which is easily done, or try out one of their products to make sure it works before you buy it, things go sideways faster than a crab in running shoes. Even if you do manage to dispatch an irate shopkeeper, every future merchant you meet is automatically aggro. I knew I shouldn't have written that negative Yelp review. You know how gift cards aren't actually that good because unlike the money they were acquired with, you can only ever spend them in one place? Well, someone should really tell this to Kilton, the creepy owner of Fang and Bone, a monster-themed shop in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild that's run out of a hot air balloon. See, while other merchants in Hyrule deal in the universally accepted rupee currency, Kilton sees himself as somewhat exempt from those rules, and presumably the trading standards authorities that govern them, because this retailer deals exclusively in Mon, a cryptocurrency that is acquired by trading Kilton bits of monsters, kind of like Bitcoin, if each Bitcoin was made of Moblin guts. <laughs> Still, you can see why he does it, because I bet a lot of people are walking around Hyrule with 31 Octorok tentacles burning a hole in their pocket. You may be Kilton's only customer, but don't expect any special treatment from this lumpen shopkeep. There's no haggling on the value of Mon, and he's certainly not about to open his stall during normal business hours, preferring instead to conduct trades under the cover of night, which is always a good sign. <laughs> But ultimately, Kilton can do what he likes because he's Hyrule's only purveyor of spooky monster-themed items, including the Dark Clothing Set, which grants increased movement speed at night in exchange for not being able to look Link in the eye without shivering. And hey, how bad can Kilton be when he'll cheerfully trade you these monster masks, which let you blend in perfectly with Hyrule's horrible beasts? Should I get my receipt? Don't worry. Those Bottle Street boys had no idea where I keep the best loot, so come by when you can. If somebody saved you from getting beaten up by thugs, you'd probably feel pretty indebted to them. Wouldn't you, Dunwall shop owner Griff? In your first assassination mission, you could stumble across Griff in the distillery district, under siege by two members of the Bottle Street gang. To the void with Bottle Street and to the void with you. Let me out. Oh, you don't want to talk to us like that. Fact is, Bottle Street is here to take its cut. So reach it to your pocket, and let's get this done. Yeah, and the inspection fee. We can't help it. Just the way we do things on Bottle Street. Players with a conscience could save Griff by dispatching the two thugs and breaking the door down to free him. I owe you, brother. I won't ask about the mask. I wouldn't want my face seen either pulling a stunt like that. 
You know what? I'll return the favor. Come by Griff's shop. That's my business. Instead of falling to his knees and offering you anything you want from his store free of charge, you instead have to listen to Griff's sob story about how things are really hard for him and how his once booming business is reduced to him scavenging for things to sell at Griff's curio shop. Want to look at some of the things I found? Good prices, I swear. Are you sure, Griff? Uh, right, let's have a look at those prices. See, here you're selling sleep darts at 100 coins a pop, but if I go to my mate Piero back at my secret base, he sells me them for 30. Also, you're not the only one who can scavenge sleep darts. What do you think I spend half my time doing in these games before actually going to save Emily? She'll understand, and if not, I'll just put her to sleep with a sleep dart. If the prices aren't off-putting enough, which, just saying, they definitely are, the second time you come around here, there are a bunch of deadly assassins hanging around above Griff's shop, just waiting for an unsuspecting Corvo. Okay, who did you blab to, Griff? I don't know if you've been following the storyline, but right now, I've got quite a lot of enemies. I mean, this better be worth a discount on those sleep darts. Damn it! Want to look at some of the things I've found? Good prices, I swear. So those are some of the shopkeepers in games who really, frankly, we think are being just a bit unreasonable. I mean, come on, can't we get a bargain? Two for one, please? Anyway, if you can think of any that we missed, then do let us know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this, then why not check out some of these other videos? Why not try and catch this one up here? Uh, or this one down here. And if you did enjoy this, then you could do us a huge favour by uh, subscribing here. Uh, everything alright, Ellen? Yeah, um, I'm really sorry, uh, but Tom Nook is going to have to have your knees. He, he, oh. he's, he's waiting on the payments and they've not come through, so... I see, no, well that's fair. Mr Nook's always been very fair. Yeah.